Today, what I wanted to, Dr. Imbar and myself, we're going to talk about uh, improving local control uh, with uh, brain tumors uh, with the Gametile platform. I'm uh, going to talk about the, go over the technology at first, um, and then talk about clinical evidence for the use in brain metastasis, as well as in gliomas, more specifically high-grade gliomas. Um, and then uh, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, so as you know, brachytherapy has uh, significant benefits uh, in that you don't have uh, entry dose, you have a sharp dose fall off, um, and then in the adjuvant senic, uh, there is no delay to starting radiation. Additionally, uh, it can reduce the need for external beam radiation, uh, which alleviates some geographical and socioeconomic barriers that some patients can have. Um, where I'm from right here, um, you know, there's many neurosurgeons that uh, have oncology experience, but there's very few radiation oncologists that specialize in CNS malignancies. Now, there are some drawbacks. Um, CNS brachytherapy has been used for several decades. Uh, the kind of main ones that were used was uh, iodine-125, uh, um, and this was used as seeds, either single or stranded, that were glued directly to the parenchyma, or it was an iodine-125 uh, solution that was infused into a balloon in the cavity. The problem with this, and there's many examples of this in the literature, was that there was a significant amount of radionecrosis uh, with up to a 40% clinical reported rate in some series. Here's an example of a patient on autopsy series um, having a significant amount of radionecrosis from uh, the glued seed variety. Part of this radionecrosis is likely due to the fact that in gluing the seeds to the surgical cavity, you're having direct contact of the normal brain parenchyma with a radioactive source. Um, further, I-125 has an effective, half effective useful life of about uh, eight months, and so uh, when you take that into consideration and the change in the volume of the surgical cavity as it evolves during the healing process, as well as some seeds maybe losing grip uh, with the glue that was used to place them, uh, you can get clustering uh, via seed migration. And, you can see in this picture here that you, you are getting areas where there's a uh, higher density of the seeds. Um, on the flip side, uh, migration can also lead to cold spots uh, where you might be underdosing at risk areas. Gametile is basically a, a evolution um, and in some ways a revolution on this paradigm of CNS brachytherapy. Uh, instead of using I-125, it uses cesium-131 with an effective life of six weeks, and it's delivered in a two by two centimeter collagen sponge carrier. This, um, the seeds themselves basically have a three millimeter offset from the surface that they are implanted on, and this decreases the hot spots that one would see with I-125 direct adhesion. Um, the tiles are spaced such that they are adjoined next to each other in the surgical cavity, and this establishes a one by one centimeter square array of the seeds, so you get a very even distribution, which decreases the risk of hot spots um, from clumping as well as cold spots, um, and this uh, basically, the collagen matrix stays stable for six months, so during the effective life of the um, source, you're basically keeping a constant arrangement of the seeds, and you're keeping the seeds off of the brain parenchyma. Another benefit is that because of the spacing, the dosimetry is extremely simple. And the placement is very simple. Uh, I've never been in an I-125 case, but I can imagine that it would be something that would take probably at least more than 45 minutes, if not two hours, to get all of these seeds um, put into position. Uh, whereas, in my experience, we usually can get everything placed within one to three minutes. So we're not really adding much at all to the craniotomy and resection time-wise. And also, it's significantly reducing worker exposure of radiation. How it's prescribed is to five millimeter depth to 60 gray. Uh, it turns out that 60 gray with cesium is about equal to an EQD2 of 60 gray, which is a common dose for definitive treatment for CNS malignancies. Um, here you can see that the PTV is made by putting a five millimeter expansion on the surgical cavity. Um, that's in magenta there. And you can see that it's well contained within the yellow, which is the 60 gray iso dose line. Um, 
the roof though is not you know counted any, any area that is it has a geographical ba barrier from the tumor is not included um, and essentially you get significant sparing of OERs this is a case which I will expand on a little bit more in the uh, later in the show uh, but essentially uh, this delivery here was just above the optic structures cochlea and the brainstem and they hardly got any dose at all and then comparing it to external beam radiation, this is a, uh, this is a patient that had uh, active, severe scleroderma involving the scalp. So we did not want to do external beam on her. We delivered gamma tile, but we decided to see what, what would the dose symmetry look like if we did do external beam radiation therapy. Um, and you can see a much larger area of uh, brain parenchyma that is getting the uh, prescription dose as well as a lot of small, uh, the low and moderate dose. And then to make a fair comparison, we did a cyber knife plan where we used a five millimeter expansion. And even with that, again, it doesn't have the conf conformality, the dose fall off, and the sparing of the OERs and normal brain parenchyma that gamma tile has. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Ember. Uh, thanks very much for including me. Um, my task today was to talk a little bit about some of the existing clinical evidence for brain metastases and to talk how our center has been using uh, the technology. So um, gametile has become an important tool for managing brain metastases at our center, and I think that there are two main ways that we've been using the product. Uh, is that better? Uh, so the two main scenarios where we've been using the product, the first is for patients with brain meta uh, metastases with radiographic or clinical evidence of progression after prior uh, external beam radiation. And most often this is stereotactic radiosurgery. However, there are situations where patients have local progression after whole brain as well. And then there are situations with uh, large metastatic sites that are planned for surgical resection that have not received prior radiotherapy. And so just wanted to review some of the rationale for both of these situations. I would say that the vast majority of patients where we've treated our center fall into category one. Um, the main reason is that we are able to deliver a strong therapeutic dose with lower integral dose to the surrounding healthy brain. The second for a metastatic population, of course, is minimizing the amount of time to the next systemic therapy. The third is that potentially there is capturing a different radiobiological mechanism of action using brachytherapy uh, compared to the fact that these patients had failed prior external beam. And then in this population, we find that there's no clear standard of care, so this has become an important part of our, our treatment program. For the patients in category two, most of them are being treated on protocol, and I'll talk a little bit about that schema a bit later. Uh, but the logic here is that they can begin their radiation immediately, uh, obviously at the time of surgery. And for many of our patients who come from far away, there's logistical convenience and sparing the need for a second MRI. Uh, the second sort of theoretical uh, potential benefit would be that there may be reduced radionecrosis risk uh, for larger surgical cavities where the dose can be more contained around the site where we did the resection. And then finally, another thing which I would say is theoretical right now is potentially reducing the risk of nodular leptomeningeal disease, which is a, a known complication after resection of large brain metastases. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the recurrent brain met population. Um, this is a significant and growing challenge. Uh, it's very heterogeneous in terms of the treatments offered to this population. And I really do think that this is going to become more and more of a challenge as our patients are living longer with better systemic therapy options. At least at our center, salvage resection remains a very, very important treatment strategy for these patients. However, after this second surgery, uh, there is a subsequent risk of additional relapse in that location, which approaches almost 50%. So this is a very high risk of local failure. Um, some centers do do adjuvant re-irradiation, either with fractionated uh, radiation or stereotactic radiosurgery. However, this is controversial, largely because you are often faced with the balancing act of local control versus the risk of additional radiation injury to the brain. Um, and this is part of the reason why we think that potentially brachytherapy has an advantage. Uh, so just to review some of these numbers, um, this was a uh, paper that came out of our center where we looked at this exact situation, recurrent brain mets after prior external beam therapy in the patients who had salvage surgery alone, you could see approached about a 50% risk of subsequent local failure after that salvage surgery. 
The patients who had adjuvant re-irradiation did a little bit better, uh, closer to 25%. However, in this population, as I said, we're always up against the balancing act of the risk of radionecrosis. Um, so what the authors of this paper did was they looked at local enhancement of some of these index lesions, and at around 18 months, you can see that it approaches about 50%. So 50% chance that there's either some local progression or radionecrosis after re-irradiation. So we looked at using uh, gametile in this population. This is prior to uh, the clinical trial that I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, these were 20 patients who were treated to 25 recurrent brain metastases over 24 different cases. All of these patients received gametile after prior stereotactic radiosurgery, which was delivered in 18 to 30 gray in one to five fractions. And in terms of the characteristics, I would say fairly reflective of the metastatic population, a range of histologies. Um, the patients received gametile on average about a, uh, a year after their prior radiosurgery. Um, you can see the distribution of systemic disease at the time of the, the tile placement. And this was a relatively uh, large group uh, of lesions, so the median maximal diameter of about three centimeters uh, pre-op. And we were encouraged to see that if you look at just the, the site, uh, so on the left you can see a cumulative incidence curve of progression-free survival in the tiled uh, lesion. The risk of local failure is quite low, uh, so less than 10% at one year. And this was compared to some of our historical cohorts that I just showed you of about 30% after re-irradiation using external beam, or re, uh, almost 40, 40 to 50% uh, with re-resection re alone and out external beam. Um, obviously, these patients do have progression outside the site, which receives brachytherapy. Um, in terms of other issues that we, we saw in this, this series, there was about a 30% risk of seed settling and shifting, which was seen um, after three months uh, from the tile placement. However, that wasn't clinically significant in any of our patients. Um, in terms of the radionecrosis risk, it was about 32%, of which half of those patients had some degree of symptomatic radionecrosis, and there was one wound complication in a heavily pretreated population. Um, there have been some other centers which have also looked at recurrent brain mets and the role of gametile. Uh, this came out of the, the BNI, um, a small series. Um, you can see they looked at stratification of local control by size, um, the, the yellow curve there being their largest mets, greater than 2.5 centimeters, and concluded that the local control was quite strong with brachytherapy, and then when they looked at the status of prior radiation, that yellow line there are lesions that had been previously irradiated with external beam, again concluding that the local control with uh, gametile was, was quite strong with only one out of 16 uh, local progression events in that series. Um, in that series, there was about a 13% risk of radionecrosis, one of which was grade one and one of which was called grade three. A more recent experience came out of the Miami Cancer Institute, also looking at recurrent brain mets. Uh, these were 10 patients with 12 brain metastases, again, heavily pretreated with external beam beforehand, uh, median follow-up of just over a year. They also found no local recurrences and in one instance of grade two radionecrosis that was managed with uh, bevacizumab. And from their paper, they actually looked at the rates of uh, freedom from local failure after the, the treatment. And just to orient you a little bit, at 6, 12, and 18 months, the green line of 100% reflects the fact that the patients uh, with after brachytherapy had no local failures, and they used every patient as an internal control. So they looked at the patients at how they did after their prior course of external beam, and you can see that most of the patients had significantly more local failure at those uh, salient time points. So at our center, we are now offering uh, patients with recurrent brain mets uh, gametile in a randomized clinical trial to try to understand whether the product is incrementally beneficial over standard of care. Um, so these are patients who um, do not have any evidence of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and still have room for re-irradiation, uh, who are not undergoing a craniectomy or cranioplasty. And all of these patients undergo an intraoperative uh, assessment, and as long as they have at least 5% viable disease on frozen, they're randomized. And these ran patients are randomized to receive either resection and gametile or resection and conventional care, of which it's left up to the investigator's discretion of what they want to do, either re-irradiation or observation. And at current, uh, we have 44 patients who were randomized, uh, seven of which did have pure necrosis in the operating room, so leaves 37 patients who are valuable. And we're looking forward to continuing that study over the, the coming months. Um, 
The uh, primary objective of that study is the rate of local control of the, the brachytherapied lesions at nine months. Um, we're looking at a number of other objectives, including uh, radionecrosis, wound complications, and time to retreatment, and then a number of exploratory objectives, including neurocognitive function. Uh, switching gears to the newly diagnosed population, pretty much exclusively those patients at our center are being managed on the Rhodes uh, trial, which is a, a national phase three study. I just wanted to review the, the schema for that. I know that there are probably others in the audience who have patients on this study. Uh, so these are patients with newly diagnosed large brain metastases, um, originally 2.5 to 5 centimeters, although recently uh, including patients with 2 to 2.5 centimeters if, if there's a surgical need. Um, these patients are enrolled and then randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either surgery plus gametile uh, or surgery plus uh, standard post-op uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, and you can see some stratifications there in terms of whether the patients have solitary or multiple brain metastases. Um, in terms of the planned enrollment, it's 180 patients across uh, up to 20 sites. Um, the outcomes are listed here, local control being the primary and then obviously a number of clinical as well as neurocognitive uh, function uh, outcomes as well. Um, and there will be an interim assessment which is performed after 35 events. So my last few minutes, I just wanted to give a few examples of patients that we've done over the last couple of years, uh, highlighting those two scenarios. The first is recurrent brain metastases. This I would describe as a bread and butter case. For us, this was a, a patient with a renal cell carcinoma with a right temporal solitary brain metastasis, actually underwent nine gray times three. Uh, unfortunately, had pretty brisk evidence of relapse in the local uh, region. That was confirmed using, uh, you know, criteria from his MRI, as well as uh, elevated perfusion, which you can see on the middle uh, picture there with significant edema. Um, this patient actually went to the operating room for resection and had gametile placed. And this was the uh, most recent MRI that was performed to this patient 16 months post implant. I would say that this is a pretty typical appearance of a post uh, tiled MRI with some sort of hazy patchy enhancement around the surgical cavity, but no nodularity concerning for uh, recurrence there and reduction of the edema. Switching gears to a newly uh, diagnosed or untreated brain metastasis, this was an 89-year-old gentleman with newly diagnosed non-small cell lung cancer, had significant extracranial disease um, and had a solitary brain met that's shown here in the left frontal region with edema uh, for a variety of reasons, given his age and performance status and the fact that this guy really needed to get on systemic therapy quickly. Uh, we thought resection made sense for him, and he was uh, treated on the road study, randomized to brachytherapy. Um, so this shows uh, the immediate post-operative CT and the dosimetry, uh, the purple there reflecting 60 gray. Um, and this was his most recent MRI that we did at six months post-implant. Uh, you can see a similar appearance of the treated cavity there. And finally, my last slide is just to demonstrate that uh, occasionally we are using brachytherapy as part of a more complicated multimodality uh, recurrent or salvage program for some of these patients. As I mentioned, as people are living longer because of systemic therapy, we're finding that they're developing increasing numbers of intracranial progression. So we are using the product uh, for part of that strategy. Um, this was a 53-year-old gentleman, also with renal cell carcinoma, had a right parietal mass, actually underwent lit for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Unfortunately, had short interval local failure and then had stereotactic radio surgery in three fractions as well at one month. Um, unfortunately, then had continued evidence of local progression, which we uh, confirmed using perfusion as well as PET imaging. There was also some evidence of progression along the lit tract as well, so it became a fairly large lesion. Um, he underwent a salvage resection with gamma tile placement, and you can see from the sagittal image there, we actually extended the tiles along the surgical tract uh, to try to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, this was uh, the one month post uh, brachytherapy scan, uh, which then contracted at our next MRI. And then actually about a year after IORT, this patient gener uh, developed uh, spontaneous symptoms, including headache and some, some weakness. Uh, imaging revealed that there was some edema around the surgical cavity. Um, we did a really extensive workup to try to make sure that this wasn't local progression with perfusion imaging. I think he had SPECT and also uh, FDG PET all of which were cold, so we managed this uh, as per radionecrosis guidelines at our center with steroids. And ultimately, he did improve after a long steroid taper. He did not need uh, bevacizumab. 
Um, and the more recent imaging, this is now 20 months from the, the brachytherapy, you can see that the MRIs look more similar to some of those other post-implant scans that, that I showed previously. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Peach to talk about glioma. going to hold the mic, I think, <laughs> instead of being hunched, hunched over. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk uh, now, switch gears up, talk about gliomas. So, why use uh, this for recurrent gliomas? Well, um, specifically with high-grade gliomas, often there's been SRS or EBRT done prior to recurrence, and so that basically limits how much you can get in with traditional external beam modalities, both uh, out of the concern of radiant necrosis um, and then concerns for the O other uh, OARs. Um, also, um, you know, with especially where, where I'm at, that's very rural, uh, sniff placement, uh, rehab can be a complicating factor that can really delay people getting treated. And in general, even if these patients do not need sniff placement or rehab, uh, there's many times where the morbidity either from the surgery or the disease itself is enough that it makes coming for fractionated external beam radiation therapy very difficult. So um, the benefit of uh, gamma tile is that uh, it can immediately and has been demonstrated to safely deliver significantly greater dose uh, to at-risk tissue uh, than traditional external beam can in the re-irradiation scenario. Um, so the BNI uh, first published a, a good series looking at this for recurrent glioblastoma. They enrolled 28 patients and uh, MGMT methylation in this cohort uh, was 11 percent uh, unmethylated 18, 71 percent unknown. Um, they all underwent resection with gamma tile. Uh, 17 of the 828 patients did receive some uh, form of systemic therapy uh, as detailed below there. And the efficacy uh, as far as local control at one year was found to be 49 percent with a median overall survival of 25 months. More uh, importantly, uh, you know, when, when we're talking about re-irradiation of something that got a significant amount of dose prior, uh, wound complication was 4 percent and radiation necrosis was 7 percent and we're talking about grade one radiographic radionecrosis, um, not, not clinically symptomatic. So here, here's a little uh, comparison to uh, outcomes reported in the literature, and you can see, you know, ranging from f about five months if you don't treat up to 10 months with external beam and bevacizumab. And um, in comparison, you know, we're looking at 16.7 um, months uh, with gametile plus and this is the cohort that did have bevacizumab of 16.7 months. Um, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison uh, because, um, again, this is, uh, you know, comparison to other published series. Um, not everyone got resection. You know, the, those patients that did not get resection, there could be bias for patients that have poor functionality. Well, uh, Dr. Chen of the University of Minnesota, one of the early adapters of gamma tile, did provide some great evidence to control for these factors. So he created a prospective series of 22 patients with uh, locally recurrent GBM. They went under resection and gamma tile. Um, they did all the molecular analysis, so this was true wild type uh, glioblastoma, um, and about 20 percent, 27 percent had the methylation. He was also able to create a control cohort of patients that he resected but did not undergo gametile placement. And again, um, these were all IDH wild type and had a very similar breakdown of methylated versus unmethylated. And then um, both the control group uh, and the experimental group uh, did have uh, a similar mix of systemic therapies added on. So at one year, the local control was found to be 81%. Uh, the median overall survival was found to be, uh, the, sorry, there was a statistically significant difference in median survival between uh, all comers, control versus gametile implantation. And then when you divide that up between methylated and unmethylated, uh, you can see that the methylated had a median overall survival of 37.4. And again, for both these groups, this difference compared to the control was statistically significant. 
And in this cohort, um, there was really no evidence of radiation necrosis or wound complications um, for the duration of follow-up. Uh, so just, again, the take home is that for all comers, uh, again, not looking at MGMT methylation status, we have a comparison here of 20 plus patients uh, showing that resection plus gametile significantly improved the median overall survival versus resection alone for recurrent glioblastoma. And so I just wanted to give a, a case study um, of uh, a case of a high-grade glioma re-irradiation. Um, I want to say that uh, gametile is, has not been exclusively studied in the pediatric uh, population. Uh, it's neither approved nor counterindicated for pediatric patients, and it's up to the physician's discretion to use it for this purpose. Uh, you'll see with the imaging, we were kind of were in a very interesting uh, situation with this patient. Initially um, a, a presented with seizure three years ago, um, right occipital mass, um, underwent maximal safe resection, and there was significant left-sided morbidity from this neurologically, and was found to have an anaplastic astrocytoma. Uh, he underwent 59.4 grays and 33 fractions. 59.4 gray and 33 fractions to the resection bed with concurrent and adjuvant tomazolamide, according to the COG uh, ACNS 0822 trial. And um, as a COG trial, they tend to use really big expansions. Um, so he did get a significant amount of uh, normal brain parenchyma treated to about 60 gray. Um, and you can see here uh, the brain is right hippocampus as well as the brain stem did get a, a rather significant amount of dose, especially when looking at having to retreat. Um, he did have a recurrence um, somewhere between one to two years out, uh, but this was just nodularity that was seen anterior to the resection cavity, um, and so they were able to go in and resect that, but then eventually he showed up with this ring-enhancing mass. The problem with this, if you can imagine right above here, this is just anterior and underneath the motor strip. And with both the initial resection and that re-resection, he ended up having more left-sided paralysis. And we're talking about a teenage boy that normally was very active. Um, it was very concerning to him and his parents about having to go back in both surgically and with more radiation. Um, we talked about it at, at length, and we thought that this was um, something where we could use 5-ALA, uh, which is a, a fluorescent dye normally used in adults to mark GBM tissue um, and see if it could show us exactly where the tumor is, try to debulk this as safe as possible, and then apply gametile. Um, and so we were able to su successfully do that. Um, you can see the tiles here. Uh, we're able to stay in place and conform to that resection cavity. And this just gives you an idea of how that spatial orientation stays consistent. The color coding here is seeds that are from the same tile. And so we ended up using a, cou a couple of full tiles. And then um, you know, on the one edge of the resection cavity, we split the tile in half and had two seeds here and two seeds there. Um, from a functional standpoint, he recovered from the surgery with no residual deficits whatsoever, um, which was great, and actually did make some improvement as far as his left-sided facial paralysis. Um, so we went ahead and we looked at this and we're like, well, what would this look like if we did do a typical re-irradiation uh, schedule? Uh, and so 35 gray and 10 fractions is, is used often. So we converted the gamma tile to EQD2 and then did the composite of what we gave versus what EBRT would be. And you can see here that we would have underdosed this area of the at-risk tissue, and then we significantly overdosed um, the intervening normal parenchyma from the initial site of disease and the area of recurrence. More importantly, we looked at the dose to the right uh, hippocampus, and you can see here that the, both the high and moderate dose to the hippocampus was significantly reduced using gametile versus what it would be with the kind of more anemic external beam dose, and this is very significant in regards to the pediatric population because uh, every gray that goes above, uh, every one gray that you go up uh, to the hippocampus has an uh, impact on memory and processing speed. So three months uh, out, he started adjuvant P PCV, no wound healing issues. Again, six months, no wound healing issues. And this is nine months post-implantation. He has some T2 flare, edematous type signal that you would see as kind of treatment effect, but absolutely no enhancement um, on the uh, resection cavity. He did 
at six months have a little bit of enhancement um, and we did a, we did gamma knife that and it's one of those things that we're still early using this uh, technology so we don't quite know um, visually what radio necrosis versus like pseudo progression versus real progression is and and the fact that he didn't have any further enhancement a after that we think that was probably a case of radio necrosis um, the last little part here that I want to talk about is uh, the rationale of using gamma tile upfront for glioblastoma. So basically, there are situations where starting external beam is delayed again, uh, being in rehab, morbidity, limiting travel. Um, and the problem with the STUP regimen is that you have a delay in therapy for four to six weeks um, after surgery. And this is a time where disease can really grow back. And so this has been studied, rapid early progression, and you can see uh, in this study up to 45% having significant amount of disease progression when it came to time of getting the MRI around simulation. So just to sort of so show the overall lay of the land for glioblastoma, it seems like every 10 to 20 years, we do have a major change that benefits therapy. Initially, it was coming to the realization early on that the more disease you get out, the better the survival. Adding radiation helps out, and getting to 60 gray creates the best amount of survival. Uh, and then you have the STUP adding the adjuvant and concurrent temozolomide, increases that medium over survival more, and I, I call this STUP2, the tumor treatment fields, Optune, push that even further. However, there's been a lot of studies, more studies than not, that show that dose escalating beyond 60 gray is actually detrimental, and this more modern study here where they use the STUP regimen failed as well. Uh, the idea being that you're subjecting the, subjecting the normal parenchyma to too much dose and that's causing uh, a decrease in overall survival. So, you know, a couple of us that were early adapters of gamma tile for various reasons got into situations where we felt like we had to use it up front for cases of glioblastoma and um, had very good success with it so far. And so, in, in reflecting back on it, it seems like gamma tile might be a possible significant advancement in glioblastoma therapy for a couple of reasons. One, you get immediate dose delivery. You don't, you don't, have, you don't have to worry about disease progressing early. Uh, you basically can bridge till you can start systemic therapy. The uh, radiation is prolonged over 28 days uh, versus six weeks of fractionated radiation therapy. So there is a hypothetical hyperfractionation radiobiology benefit to doing that. Uh, that might improve. There's greater BED with uh, sources over EBRT. In particular with uh, gamma tile, cesium has a greater BED than an iodine, less radiating necrosis, which have we've demonstrated uh, in several publications, than uh, I-125. Um, and this idea of we can boost the disease right where the most at-risk disease is to beyond 60 gray, but with the, the sharp dose fall off, it's possible that subjecting that tissue a little further out to less dose, we can get a benefit from dose escalation without imparting more radio necrosis and affecting things like white blood cell count. So um, this is actually the, the first case that I had um, where we decided to do upfront gamma tile delivery and kind of was the perfect scenario, unfortunately, for the patient to do so. A uh, 40-year-old female developed seizures. Uh, she was uh, homeless, uh, schizophrenic, and had significant substance abuse issues. And she went from having something that looked like it could be a low-grade glioma to, in three weeks, classic-looking glioblastoma. Surgery was canceled several times. And because of the instability of her socially, we thought there was no way that we can do fractionated radiation therapy. So we decided, all right, this is her shot, let's do it. So we, we go ahead and uh, this is what she looked like pre-op. We ended up uh, delivering 8.5 tiles. Again, this uh, DRR here shows how well the distribution of the, the seeds are. And again, the color coding showing the individual tiles nesting up next to each other. And then what ended up happening was that she really got better. Um, it was almost wondered, we almost wondered, given the frontal location, if that was exacerbating her behavior her, the things getting away of her treatment. She was being very cooperative. She was living with her parents. So I talked to her and her parents. I was like, listen, we've never done anything like this, but you know, you're young. We're not really doing the standard of care. And usually we want to give a, a moderate dose a little further out. Maybe we can add external beam radiation to this, but you got to know that we've never done anything like this. And, and they were, they thought that she could do it. She thought she could do it. Um, and so we went ahead and basically came up with strategy of doing, you know, typical stuff, uh, 
regiment of 46 to 50 gray uh, expansions, but what we did was the PTV basically, or CTV basically consisted of the normal expansion with the 46 gray isodose line cut out. Um, and so uh, both, um, <coughs> both Dr. Brockman um, uh, and um, Dr. Brockman and the rest at uh, Gamma Tau were extremely, extremely, extremely helpful in basically figuring out the radiobiology behind this. Uh, we kind of delved into the LDR da data and the radiobiology that we're doing with I-25 back in the 80s and 90s and basically found out that 60 gray is about 60 gray and we were able in velocity to make a curve that would make the adjustments to account for the, different, uh, the difference between the uh, brachytherapy and the external beam. Uh, so essentially, uh, we basically faded the dose in so it matched the decreased dose from the uh, gamma tile, and this was done with five arcs, two that were non-coplanar, and we were able to get something like this donut that when you add it on top of the gamma tile converted to EQD2, we're getting a nice 46 to 50 gray to the lower risk group, and then it's 60 gray and up uh, from the gamma tile. So, this is just shows she's done well. She's done amazing since her uh, surgery and since the radiation. No issues at all as far as any morbidity. Um, she's not shown any significant radionecrosis radiographically. And this is her now, 26 months post-implantation. Again, on the flare, seeing some usual findings you would see after a radiation. But the T1 uh, post-contrast, nothing is lighting up. Nothing suspicious at all. And this is an experience that uh, both Dr. McCracken and, and outside of Atlanta and Dr. Chen in Minnesota have, have both um, with off-trial patients, and we have a trial for this patients, have seen this better than usual um, outcomes. And so to close, I just want to talk real quickly about uh, two of the trials relating to what I just talked about. Uh, the one I, I kind of alluded to already is Gestalt, and this is basically a, a phase one trial looking for safety uh, profile and proof of concept of doing this combination radiation. Um, and then the other one is Pathways, which is basically a randomized trial looking at recurrent glioblastoma and randomizing uh, with or without gamma tile with systemic delivery. Now the nice thing about the Gestalt trial, and I kind of overlooked this, is trying to figure out how to dose symmetrically combine the external beam with with the gamma tile was, we had some really, really super smart dosimetrists and physicists that, that helped figure that out, and it's a lot of work. Uh, but uh, Dr. Turner and Dr. Brockman worked with MIM and basically came up with a plugin that does all of that math for you. You basically put in the dose that gamma tile delivered, you put in the CTV that you want for the low dose uh, region, and then it churns out a perfect plan for you. So uh, don't let that combination um, discourage you from trying to, to do this. Um, if you're a trial member, you get that plugin that does all that work for you. So essentially, this is like the STUP regiment. The only difference here is that the external beam part is in four weeks, high, slightly hyperfractionated. Um, I believe Dr. Stupp thought that there would be a benefit radiobiologic for that phase to have some hyperfractionation. Um, and then after a brief period, you have temozolomide plus or minus tumor treatment fields. Now, um, you know, Patients are rolled beforehand. If it turns out that the patient does not have GBM on final uh, pathology, those patients are still followed for safety profile and whatnot, but they will not be included in the, uh, the 61 patients for the trial. And it's currently um, enrolled at uh, several sites and, and, and enrollment has been increasing. Um, the last one, Pathways, is going to likely open up at the end of this year. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a nice looking randomized uh, trial where we're controlling for um, basically a, a nice comparison between with or without gamma tile, primary outcomes, overall sur survival, usual secondary outcomes. And with this, we're looking at a, uh, a recruitment of 600 patients. Um, and then in both arms, there will be uh, Lomustine or Bevacizumab uh, randomized um, between the two groups. Uh, so in conclusion, um, you know, initial case series and single institution experience are showing very durable control of recurrent brain metastasis after previous external beam with a very good side effect profile. Um, there's two ongoing prospective trials that will basically nail down what is the role for gamma tile in both the newly diagnosed and as the recurrent brain metastasis setting. Um, 
what I went over as, uh, as far as recurrent glioblastoma, I think that there's really good single institution evidence for the use of it in high grade glioma re irradiation. And the Pathways trial is going to give us the definitive evidence to show the benefit of doing so. Um, again, uh, several early adapters of gametile have shown case by case some remarkable results using it up front for glioblastoma um, and uh, we are working to get to a randomized trial to show that benefit um, but it's something that given the results that I've seen we've now done six uh, patients this way that uh, this could be a potential paradigm shift on how we treat glioblastoma but in the meantime uh, for the many practitioners that use gametal it has become and an indispensable tool for CNS re irradiation, especially in this immune therapy era where patients are just living long but with a lot more disease burden. And it's become a very precise tool for patients that have very unique, specific situations that makes external beam just not doable. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone, and uh, we're welcome to any questions. Thank you for the great talk. Can you guys hear me? So I was wondering if there is, if you guys have any insight on whether or not the presence of the gamma tile affects the accuracy of an MR perfusion scan. You know, is a radiologist having a harder time determining between radiation necrosis or progression because of the gamma tile? Uh, we haven't seen that at our center. We do perfusion pretty standard for every uh, post-treatment scan and haven't heard from many of our radiologists that they thought there was interference from the, the product there. Yeah, a, a very similar experience that they, they, they haven't really had any issue with that. Uh, Dr. Peach, maybe I can ask you um, for your recurrent GBM. You know, it's a it's a pretty challenging patient population. There is often competing sort of. Uh, trials and treatment strategies. So how is your center thinking about, you know, which patients are being routed towards brachytherapy and re-resection? Well, um, I, I think the one thing that we've come across where we ended up using it quite a bit is that um, we just find that, and, and this, I, I'm not the one deciding this, so right. I can't speak to what it is, but the neurosurgeons find that it's very hard to do lit in these patients, that just where the tumor is, it ends up not being a good place for it. So that kind of pushes lid away. And then, um, you know, I think the, we have a lot of buy-in from our neurosurgeons. They've seen how well it has done for us with uh, meningiomas that have been treated three or four times, uh, metastases that are either are recurrent or have, re there's a recurrence right next to where we previously irradiated, mm -hmm. that when you look at how much dose you get in, um, it, it kind of just makes sense to do that rather than trying to squeeze in more external beam. Makes sense. How about the, I would say, the, the same question towards you for metastasis? Um, I think for patients who require uh, salvage resection, pretty uniformly at this point, we're at least offering the study for all of those patients. Um, we go through waves. I think there are some periods where we're a little more surgically aggressive on these patients and, and sort of shuttle them early to surgery. Um, there are other periods where I think we try some medical management first, be it steroids or... Uh, you know, occasionally a Vastin, and then obviously that sets the clock back on when you can do the re-resections. But I would say for most of the patients with large recurrent brain mets, we're at least considering the trial for them. Hi, I was just wondering about quality of life uh, following the procedure, how you're looking at it and assessing it in your clinical trials, and if you have any kind of comments about how the patients feel afterwards. Go first. You, you can, I, I didn't too much rock music in my youth. Got it. Um, so quality of life. Uh, so there's the whole uh, battery of neurocognitive testing that is part of the uh, studies that we're doing. Uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't been analyzed yet on, I'm not sure about roads, but certainly not on a recurrent trial. It's definitely something that we want to do. Um, anecdotally, though, the patients feel, I would say, pretty similarly to our standard post uh, surgery course. Um, we, we follow up with them usually 
anywhere between four and six weeks after their surgery. And I, would, I haven't noticed any major differences in, in sort of status at that point. Um, some of the patients, though, do comment that they appreciated that the radiation was just done at the time of the resection, and they don't have to come back for some of those visits. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety for these recurrent patients because they're also competing with, I need to get back on systemic therapy. Some of them have extracranial progression of disease as well. So I do find, I think that there is this signal of, uh, it's, it's psychologically helpful to just know that that part of their treatment is done and they can sort of get back to the, the medical therapy that they need. But um, definitely we need more objective, I think, look at particularly neurocognitive function for them. Yeah, um, I'm definitely seeing very, very similar experience that from a acute post-op uh, standpoint, no difference between those that just got a resection. Um, haven't really seen any um, anything that I could definitely tie into as being a result of, of the radiation doing anything morbidity-wise either. Um, and both for pathways and gestalt, there's going to be they're going to look be looking at a lot of those different functional. Uh, inventories uh, and sort of and you know especially with pathways and that we're going to have a randomization with or without gamma tile we'll be able to tease out if there's anything like that actually going on hi um, I'm curious how much uh, variation do you see between surgeons is there much of a difference I mean the outcomes maybe seem consistent but between their ability to place the tiles in the right place and then second question follow up on that um, if, uh, how do you handle a situation where maybe the surgeon goes in and isn't able to resect as much as they anticipated and you need to cover a deeper range? What do you do in that situation? So, um, you know, we uh, basically at my institution, uh, the uh, chair of neurosurgery trained at BNI was the one that got it brought in. Uh, and was the one using it primarily. Now there's three other neurosurgeons, um, including a pediatric neurosurgeon that um, he has trained. And so just from, from my experience, and I imagine this would probably be the same at other institutions, you kind of have someone who carries the torch at first and then they're showing everyone else how to do it. And so uh, as a result of that, um, as far as calculating how much uh, tiles to get, how much we end up using, um, the placement ends up being pretty uniform. Um, you know, if you if you blindfolded me, I wouldn't be able to tell who did it. Um, and then, as far as um, sorry, the second question was um, residual disease. Oh yes, yeah, so um, you do get into situations uh, where uh, you the the neurosurgeons think there's going to be a, a, a certain size surgical cavity. Um, you know, part of the dosimetry you, you do, there is a correction factor for what the pre-op imaging is versus what it usually ends up being, but there are outliers. There are some people that have more pressure from the surrounding going in there. So there is times where we think we're going to use four tiles and we use two and a half. But again, it's a very robust system because of that predetermined spacing. So as long as you get those tiles next to each other, you're going to end up getting, with the exception of very, very small sized lesions, which you, you generally would not do to start with, you get that five millimeter depth of, of coverage. Um, I, think there's, I think there's definitely skill to placing these, um, not to knock them, but sometimes uh, usually our surgeons, they'll let like the fellows or the residents try first, and then they can usually, the attending can usually get maybe one or two more in. So I definitely think there's a learning curve to this. Uh, I think that's part of the process and, and usually letting them train and, and get better. Um, but, I, but I agree, I think that there is usually a champion in every department and we have one uh, person who is present for some of the cases and, and make sure that the, the placement looks uh, uniform. Um, in terms of residual disease, we've done two things. Uh, one is if they know at the time of resection that there's residual, occasionally we flip the tiles so that actually the there's a there's a directionality to it. Um, one side is hotter than the other, so sometimes we'll put the hotter side if we know that there's some gross residual. Um, the other is that we've done short interval reassessment scans, and if there's sort of a nodule that's maybe too deep that the surgeon wasn't able to access, and it looks like it's outside of our dosimetry. Occasionally, we've done some stereotactic radiosurgery to whatever the residual is, or just keep a close eye on it if we're a little worried and it's in the marginal dose region of the, the brachytherapy. But we, we've done things like that uh, to try to compensate for, for suboptimal dosimetry. 
Yeah, yeah there, there was, uh, t to that extent, I, I, I did forget, we, we did have a patient where we went into, into it knowing that there was going to be an arm of disease that was going in towards the internal capsule that we would leave behind. And so in that situation, um, that was kind of our first dry run in trying to match the dissymmetry. This was before we had the GBM patient, where uh, basically we applied the gamma tile, we, we got a rough approximation of what the dose was, and then we figured out how much more do we have to add to this little arm of disease. Um, and that the, the patient ultimately uh, died from disease progression, but he, he had a, a good control for more than probably eight months. Thank you, Dr. Peach and Dr. Ember for great talks, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions, please come to our booth, booth 2723, um, for clinical office hours at 1.30. So Dr. Mike Garcia will be there to answer any questions you may have. So, so thank you.